Welcome to Unit 7 and 8, where we take the forecast we have generated and use them to develop an estimate of the value of the equity or the shares in a company, as well as the enterprise or asset value. When building a valuation model, you need to consider whether it is more appropriate to focus on the equity, that is shares, or the assets. As a retail investor, when you are working out whether to buy or sell shares in a company, equity value is the focus. If you're considering, say, a private equity-led purchase of an entire business, then enterprise value would be more relevant. Our valuation models are consistent with what we learn from finance. That is, the value of any asset should be the present value of the payoffs from holding the asset. The payoffs from holding a share is the right to receive a dividend. So the value of a share should be the present value of the expected dividends that you will receive from owning that share. Despite the discounted dividends model being consistent with finance theory, we don't see dividends-based valuation models used at all downtown. There are a number of reasons for this, including the fact that many firms do not pay dividends and that share buybacks have become a common alternative to dividend payments. We address this by developing valuation models that are algebraically equivalent to our dividend-based model, but focus on measures of either free cash flows or earnings. It's important to remember that the theory underpinning each of these models is the same. That is, if implemented correctly from the same set of forecasts, the value we estimate from the dividends model, a cash flow model, or an earnings-based model must be the same. So one model is not better than another. What they do is allow us to focus on different things, and you might have a preference for one model over another in specific circumstances. We can move from dividends to free cash flows to equity holders by considering dividends as the amount that could be paid out to shareholders once we consider what cash the firm can generate from its operations, adjusted for the cash required for working capital and investing activities, and any changes in net debt. This is the same as taking net income and adjusting for the change in the book value of operating assets and the change in net debt over the course of the year. Note that we already have generated forecasts of net income and the changes in the necessary balance sheet items in the forecasting structure we developed in the previous unit. To implement the discounted cash flow to equity valuation model, we take our forecasts of free cash flow to equity holders and discount them back into dollars today. This requires the use of a discount rate. If we're valuing equity, then it's the cost of equity capital. I'll cover discount rate estimations in a separate video. One additional issue we need to think about is how many years worth of detailed forecasts we use before we come up with our terminal value estimates. That's the year when all of the forecasts we make last week are assumed to stay constant. Sales growth, profit margins, turnovers, cost of debt and capital structures. Again, more on how we make that determination in a separate video. An alternative to the cash flow model that is still derived from the dividend model is to think about how the way in which retained earnings works in an accounting system. The end of year value of retained earnings is the start of year value plus net income for the year, less dividends paid during the year. We can restate that in terms of dividends. In other words, dividends equals net income, less the changes in retained earnings over the year. If we assume that all changes in shareholders' equity go through the income statement, and this is what we call clean surplus accounting, then dividends can be expressed as net income for the year, less the change in book value of shareholders' equity for the year. We can then substitute that term into the discounted dividends model. What we end up with is known as the residual income valuation model or the abnormal earnings model. This is because we need to forecast a measure of residual income each year. Residual income is net income, less the appropriate charge for the capital employed. When valuing equity, the charge for cost of capital is the start of year book value of equity, multiplied by the cost of equity capital. We use start of year shareholders equity, since that represents the investment that the shareholders had in the firm. This gives us a measure of normal or required earnings for the year. We subtract this normal or required earnings from the net income either actual or forecast, to get our measure of residual income. 
The residual income model takes the present value of the expected residual income and adds that to the current book value of shareholders' equity at the start of the forecasting period. Again, if we're valuing equity, the appropriate discount rate is the cost of equity capital. The notion of residual income has long been around. It represents a measure of whether managers are adding value or not. The normal earnings or required earnings is a benchmark figure. What shareholders would expect the firm to generate in earnings given its level of risk. If managers can generate higher income than this benchmark, then they're adding value. If they generate lower earnings than the benchmark, then they're destroying value. Finally, we can modify the free cash flow models and the earnings based models to estimate the value of the enterprise, not just the equity. That is, the value of the operating assets, however they have been funded. We need to ensure we maintain consistency in doing so. The free cash flow to assets, or enterprise, is of the same functional form as the DCF to equity holders, but uses net operating profit after tax rather than net income, and net operating assets rather than book value of equity. This reflects the difference in focus, that is, on all financiers of the firm. Similarly, we use the discount rate applicable to both debt and equity, that is WAC, or the weighted average cost of capital. For the residual earnings model applied to enterprise valuation, we determine residual operating income. Again, we'll use net operating profit after tax rather than net income, and net operating assets rather than book value of equity. Next week, we'll focus in more detail on some of the issues that arise when implementing our valuation models. We'll consider cost of capital issues, we'll consider undertaking sensitivity analysis, selecting a forecasting horizon, and also look at the use of common multiples in valuation and difficult to value firms.